Yeah, here they come. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, tēnā kōtū, tēnā kōtū, tēnā tātou katoa. My name's Catherine. I'm from the Shop Cure team. And today we have uh, Bruce Wilson joining us for a presentation or a webinar uh, called There's No Such Thing as an Accident. And we're going to unpack some of the reasons behind the crashes. So thank you to everyone for joining us on this rather humid uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, this is not a presentation about COVID, so a little bit different. Uh, so today I'm just going to go over some format before we uh, hand over to Bruce. So hopefully you can all see the screen in front of you now. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, my name is Catherine. I'm the transport manager for Shopcare. I'm going to do a very um, brief poll uh, just at the start of this presentation before we hand over to Bruce, just so we understand where our attendees are from. I'm going to give you a really brief overview about Shopcare, who we are, and why we've connected with Bruce. Uh, then I'll hand over to Bruce, who's our Forensic Crash Analyst and Road Safety Consultant. And we will also have time at the end of the presentation for some Q&A. I would say, however, uh, that if you've got some burning questions, pop them into the Q&A, and if they're relevant for where Bruce is in his presentation, we can ask those during the time, otherwise we'll hold them to the end. I'm envisaging there'll be quite a lot of questions that come out of the presentation today. It's a really uh, interesting topic and one that everybody's involved in in some way, shape or form. Um, there will um, also be a very short survey at the end of today's presentation. So really just a, a few questions, shouldn't take you more than a couple of minutes. And it would be really beneficial for us if you could complete that survey. Uh, one other thing to mention is that if we could use the Q&A function opposed to the chat function, that would be appreciated. And so you're all aware, this presentation is being recorded today and will, will be available on the Shopcare website and also our YouTube channel. So uh, who is Shopcare? Well, Shopcare is a health, safety and wellbeing association. and We work within the retail, manufacturing, logistics and transportation sectors. And we're really all about uh, reducing harm across the workplace. We're supported by industry and also by the. So in terms of what our purpose is, we're really about connecting people together and connecting people to solutions. So what may happen in one business may be similar to another. Uh, some uh, businesses may have issues around some health and safety concern. Another business may have that same concern. And by connecting people together, we can share what happens in one business and hopefully benefit another. And they can change it into the situation in which is suitable for them. So really, it's all about connecting people together. Uh, one of our main sort of focal areas is around critical risks. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term critical risk, uh, a critical risk is ultimately uh, a risk that will ultimately harm, seriously harm or kill you. And earlier on um, in the shop care journey, so we're just over two years old now, uh, my colleague Wes, who's also on this call, conducted a survey with our um, industry members. And that survey, it, basically noted that there were seven really common themes in terms of critical risks across the industries that we represent. Two of those themes, the light passenger vehicle driver safety and the transportation of particularly heavy goods vehicles or trucks um, came out as two of the, the seven most common critical risks. So with that, um, we've linked up with, with Bruce today and uh, those are two risks that, that Bruce will be um, talking about today around his presentation. Um, just quickly as well, before we move on, uh, we have a number of events across the year. So because of COVID, those will normally be online. So there'll be formal webinars like today and also less formal industry sharing sessions, which is more a collaborative um, opportunity where you can come together and discuss your um, situations or your harm with, with other people across industry. We have a number of different resources on our website. Um, as I've said to you already, we have a critical risk uh, theme that runs throughout all of our work. There is a really extensive um, exposure report that's due to go on our website in the next week or so. Uh, also another resource that you may find of interest is a driver safety guide. Again, that should be made available in the next couple of weeks. We also have another couple of um, resources that you may find useful. They are free to download. Some of the projects that we're involved in are on the right hand side of this slide. Um, so we uh, are, are strongly uh, involved in a project around managing vehicle risks across the supply chain. 
Uh, I'm also involved in a standardization of site markings project um, that is supported by WorkSafe. We have a strong um, area of manual handling um, and also site traffic management. Two areas that are up and coming are um, violent and aggressive behavior, and that's more related to the retail sector. And finally, mental health, um, which is a watch this space as well, that will be in the transport uh, sectors. So um, I'll just uh, pass on to, to Bruce shortly, but before I do, I just wanna do a quick poll so we understand uh, where our uh, members are from today, so where our participants are from. So I'll just launch the poll. And if you wouldn't mind taking a moment just to answer this one. So you should see a poll in front of you at the moment. So it's basically to understand which industry or sector you work in. It gives us an idea of who's on our call today. See those coming through. give you a couple more seconds. So quite a, a wide range of people across different sectors, which is good to see. I think I'll just end the poll there. And just so you can you can see yourself as well. We have um, probably just a, a short majority in the transport, uh, followed by logistics and supply chain and other. So I'll just stop that there and uh, I'll just hand over to Bruce now. So if you're not aware, Bruce is a leading crash investigator with over 16 years experience in the New Zealand police force, um, primarily in the road policing and crash investigation space. Uh, I will, uh, however, allow you, Bruce, to talk more about your experience. But the, the real benefit that we have today is having somebody that's been on the roads and seen it all and can then share that experience with, uh, with us. So thank you, Bruce, really appreciate your time today. Oh, cool, um, thanks, Catherine. Um, oh, visible? Yeah, uh, look, thanks, Catherine. Um, today's sort of bit of an introduction uh, around crash investigation. So for me, um, I really wanna just sort of touch on a few subjects and really come back from my experience, which look is around um, 16 years in the police, um, I was a frontline attendee, then I became a crash analyst, and my final role in the police actually was as the uh, supervising instructor for crash, so it was my role to train police officers from the recruit level all up to the serious crash analyst, and in part of that role I started to see a number of factors sort of coming out in our crashes, and I guess as some of you are as well, a little bit frustrated with um, our road trauma, and we don't talk about that road toll, but our road trauma and how actually is it influencing us and how is New Zealand is we're not doing a great job on the roads and we shouldn't really be accepting that either. So I'm just going to share my screen here and hopefully we will all come up. So for me, um, crash investigation is an interesting topic. It's a topic that I have a great passion for. And the big part for me around that crash investigation is they must be investigated to be prevented. And that's a big push from the government agencies, all about evidence-based um, decision-making. But if we don't investigate those from a government point of view, or even from an employment or, or a company point of view, we're not gonna get those right information out. And we're not gonna get, we're gonna get our opinions coming over the facts. And really facts should have formed our opinions, not the other way around. So the big part about that, and a little bit of a catchphrase, and it's something that comes up in um, obviously the topic is, uh, my little theory, and this comes out from a lot of crash analysts as well, is there's no such thing as an accident. So you won't hear a lot of us crash investigators or analysts, and this is around the world, using the term of accident. We really need to start pulling back from that because really the term accident promotes the concept that these events are outside human influence or control and the fact that we don't have contributing or causative factors around those. And these motor vehicle crashes and the resulting injuries are predictable and preventable events. And if we look at them properly, we can actually start to see what's causing our factors. And that's where the, the safe system approach comes worldwide, is actually looking at all aspects of a crash and not calling them accidents and not leaving them as just, well, it's something that happens. Because as you can see over the, the recent road toll over the Christmas New Year, you know, we have what, and I know it's using the word COVID, but we have what's called the COVID paradox and crash. And around the world, 
even though we have less people on the roads, less kilometres being travelled, especially in 2019, 2020, 2021, we've actually had an increase in crash. And in America, that's actually been quite prevalent, but it's also been prevalent through Europe and even in New Zealand. So nothing else has changed. The roads really haven't changed. The vehicles haven't changed. It's actually the driver. And I think that's the important aspect, as Catherine was saying, which is around risk identification. That's really what we're coming down to is the drivers are losing a little bit of practice, but also they're losing a little bit of identifying what a risk is and a hazard, and they're doing those unsafe overtaking manoeuvres. And it's not just the mistakes that are spoken about so much on the media. The majority of the crashes over the recent uh, area, over the Christmas New Year break, were all conscious decisions made by drivers, uh, unsafe overtaking, um, speed, fatigue, alcohol, all those normal factors. They are really predictable results of the laws of physics. And that's where a crash investigator or a crash analyst works in. We work in the evidence. And from that evidence, we can actually reconstruct or put the crash back together. And if we, we were looking for the why, why did the crash happen? For that, though, we need to know how did it happen. And that's really what we're coming back to in crash investigation or any investigation is how that has actually occurred. What are the results? And as I've sort of alluded to, if we can identify these contributing factors, we can take action to mitigate them. We're never going to reduce them to nothing, but we can mitigate those causes. And if we look at the crashes properly, and we look in the aspects that I'll be talking about, we can actually start making some educated, efficient, monetarily efficient inroads into increasing the safety on the roads. And really taking it away from that word road toll and that accepted limit to actually saying, well, what actions can we take? There are actions, all of us, and we are, as they will say, we're all responsible for road trauma. So how do we look at that? Um, just of interest, this background image here is um, a crash from the Southern Motorway that I investigated. When I actually arrived, that truck and that ute were about a metre away from each other. So in this case here, the driver of that car, which is a Toyota Corolla, if you're trying to work it out, survived with just a broken neck and fully recovered physically from the crash but she is still under quite a lot of psychological stress as a result of that crash, because as you can imagine, her car was pretty crushed. So like any other crash, and like this one here, we have what most people would assume is a simple nose to tail crash. We actually need to have a look at all the factors that contributed to this crash happening. So we basically are gonna distill these all down into, into an area so we can get out those contributing and causative factors, taking the emotion away from the crash, and giving an objective look to actually how we look at it. So our first area that a crash analyst or even most of the government agencies will look at is roads. And when we use the term roads, we are also looking at environment, roadsides, weather, um, layout. So that might be the roads and areas around a town centre or the buildings surrounding the road as well. And we have a look at and see how they have contributed pre-impact and also post-impact. So a crash has occurred, could it have been prevented? But then also, what is the result of that crash? Was there a power pole in the area that has led to more serious injuries? Can we reduce um, uneven road surface? All those sort of aspects. The other one we look at is the vehicle side of things. And when we look at the vehicle side, we're not just looking at, uh, is it up to warrant a fitness standard? Any good crash investigator is actually gonna want an independent inspection of the vehicle. Brakes, steering, suspension, or all those factors in there. Could the vehicle have a design flaw or as we're finding in a lot of modern vehicles, they have, they have quite a thick, and think about the vehicles you drive as well, they have quite a thick A-pillar on them, which is the pillar that runs up the side of the uh, windscreen. That's been put in to increase crash survivability. Unfortunately, what that's leading to is quite a large blind spot for car drivers, especially in roundabouts and intersections where motorcycles, pedestrians, even cars can be obscured by that uh, pillar in the vehicle. So that's that side of things we're looking at. And then the final part, and probably the most important part of this entire system or process, which we're distilling down is the user. And we use the term user because it's anyone that's involved. It's not just the drivers, it's the pedestrians, motorcyclists, cyclists, could be the traffic control person at a temporary roadworks. It could be a number of other factors, but it's the users that are actually involved in the system and the road system itself. Now, some of you may be thinking, and when we start looking at what we see in the media, we always see that it's a dangerous piece of road. It's a dangerous instance and it's unsafe. But what the data has actually come out over the decades of crash investigation and looking at this is that the vehicle makes up about 5% of the contributing factors for a crash. 
Now that might be a little bit surprising for people. And we need to think about that if the vehicle's got bald tires, that's not the vehicle's fault. What we're talking about is an issue with the vehicle that wasn't a result of a lack of maintenance, or it might be a design flaw. Um, but really in the end, it's 5% of the time, it's the vehicle that contributes to the crash occurring. The next part is the roads. Now, as I said, and for a lot of people, they may think that makes up a larger proportion, but in the end, the environment, the roads and the roadsides from what the data shows us is it makes up about 10% of the contributing factors in a crash. Now, I'm sure there'll be a few people and willing to answer questions at the end around that side, but 10% of the time, it's a road factor or an environmental factor. So what that's leaving us with is the user, conservatively, around 85% of the time, it is the user that is the contributing and the causative factor around the crash occurring. And that's where we come back to that risk identification area. That's where the driver themselves, for a lot of crashes we're seeing on our roads, it's a lack of the understanding of risks and hazards that are presented to them. Now, that's not to say that engineering and improving road safety is not going to um, lead to improvements and vehicle safety as well, and having more safety systems on vehicles. And we need to look at it as an entire system, but we need to start actually looking and concentrating on the area around the user. It is the driver of the vehicle, it is the pedestrian, it is the motorcyclist that 85% of the time are contributing to that crash occurring. And as I said, once we bring this all down, we can bring it into the contributing and causative factors behind the crash. And we can start making some evidence-based, some educated opinions and then responses to it happening instead of, as we see more often, trial by media or people that may be well-intentioned but don't understand the reason or the causative factors behind the crash. And that's part of where a thorough, good investigation happens and we get that good data that's available to us. And unfortunately, in this day and age, that is lacking in a lot of the crash investigation that's happening in the country. So I've talked about the roads and the vehicle only being around 15% of the contributing factors. What we'll do is I'll have a quick look now around the human factor side of it and the user side of it. And that's most of this con um, presentation is around that side. There's obviously also still road and vehicle issues, but it comes back to those human factors. So the big one we talk about in crash analysis, and it's something that is um, quite commonly uh, misunderstood and misrepresented, and there's quite a lot of misnomers and myths around, is perception response. So when a driver or a user is confronted with a hazard in front of them, the evasive tactic they take is actually the last sequence in a series of operations that is done. And that's basically around the fact that the human body has evolved. We're evolved from hunters. So whilst we're tens of thousands of years on from that, we're not actually evolved to driving vehicles. And the way our brain processes that information, that continuous flow of information that we get when we're a driver, it actually takes time for that information to happen. It takes time to process that. And in that stage is where a lot of people were involved in crashes. They may actually not have been able to perceive and respond to the crash that's happened. Because again, it's a process. And that's where we fatigue, distraction, alcohol and drugs start affecting this perception response. So what we'll do is we'll have a look at a little bit of the model um, that's uh, from one of the world leaders in perception response and just see the process that comes through with it. And the whole idea around this process is just a quick overview so you can start to understand that it is not simply person driving down the road, they see a hazard and they react. It is actually a process that's involved that the brain actually has. And when you understand a little bit of that, you can start to understand why some of the crashes are starting to happen and then look at avenues and areas that you can do to, to reduce some of those distractions and those other factors that are involved. So the first part and the most important part is recognition. The driver or the user needs to identify it or needs to be able to see it for them to respond to it. And this is nothing that's more reinforced than driving at night when we're driving with a set of headlights that are designed only to um, illuminate the road 50 meters in front of us. If you can't see the hazard, then the body can't process that information to then make a response, whether it's steering, braking, or acceleration. So that's the important part of it. And we will look at that in investigations around the side of, could the person have actually seen this? And we'll talk about this a little bit um, later in each one of these stages around some of the problems with terms that are quite commonly used, which is there to be seen, or they were visible, so they should have been seen. So our driver 
and we have on this occasion is recognize there's a hazard. They can see something in front of them. The next part of it is they need to recognize its significance, their perception. What does this hazard present to them? It may be, um, we'll take a New Zealand classic, there is a dead possum on the road in front of them. They've identified it as a dead possum. What is its significance to them? If they're driving a car or a truck, that's not much of a hazard or risk for them. If they're operating a motorcycle, that possum then becomes more of a risk to that motorcyclist than it would to a car driver or a truck driver. And this is the important side of things in here is that recognition of its significance. And this is where we can sometimes see in crashes and then you'll see in the media that the person pulled out in front of the motorcycle and the driver of the vehicle said, well, I didn't see the motorcycle. There's actually quite a lot of studies into the psychology around this and the fact that the human mind has to process a whole lot of information and unfortunately, if they're looking at a car and a truck and a motorcycle, the human mind will actually basically push the motorcycle away as being a threat. And they can legitimately, what we call, look but fail to see the motorcycle. And that's come out in a lot of um, studies and simulators and things like that as well. It's a very interesting area around what is a hazard and how do we identify it as a person as a hazard. And there's a little bit of training around that side of things as well. Our next part of our process is our decision-making process. And this is the one that actually takes the most time. This is where training and familiarity will mean this process or this performance of this task is a lot more successful. And this is where good driver training comes in or good road safety training comes in um, for the likes of school children, uh, for pedestrian crossings, or as we see with a lot of other cases, pedestrians, and it's understanding their environment and then what is the most appropriate situation. So for a driver, that's actual advanced practical driver training. What is the vehicle like in an emergency? What does it feel like when it's emergency braking? How do I respond to a loss of control? All those factors in here make this decision-making process a whole lot faster and more successful. So we've recognized it, we've perceived it as a hazard, and then we've made our decision. And in this case here, we're gonna use braking because it's quite a simple solution to it. And the person's going to respond with braking. It is only at this point which can be anywhere and depending on the situation from about 0.5 of a second all the way up to two and a half seconds later where the person will actually react, which happens to be steering, acceleration or braking. So there's a process that's involved in between here and sometimes drivers at the scenes of crashes and that don't understand that, the police don't understand it. When it's been investigated, the fact is there is a time frame, and depending on the situation, we can't throw a, a standard time out for everyone which is quite commonly used by roading engineers, but every situation from actual crashes and test data is different. So we need to be able to appreciate the difference behind that. And that could be something as simple as driving through an intersection and having someone come into your path. So say they've failed to give way to you, an average driver responds in about 1.5 seconds, but they can actually still respond up to two and a half seconds later. And if that's 50 kilometers an hour, that's 14 meters a second, every second. So if we're talking about one and a half seconds, they're looking 30, 40 meters down the road before they've actually begun to start to steer, accelerate or brake. And this is something that roading engineers look at, but it's also something you can look at in your industry as well around where they, uh, a truck and trailer may have to turn into a yard. You know, What is the actual time we could expect people to respond to that vehicle? How long is the truck gonna take to take that turn? All those sort of actions, so it's not just crash related, we can actually use it in the prevention side of things as well. So let's break down the recognition, the perception, the decision and see what factors actually affect this process. So the first one, um, perception, and it's quite a common one we hear out there is, I didn't see it. Look, as a police officer, as I said, I've attended over a thousand crashes. This one is very common, I didn't see it. And this crash here is quite a common crash. I worked on Auckland motorways for eight years and the number of traffic attenuators that crashes that I attended. The driver of that uh, little Toyota Surf there was adamant that he didn't see it. Now, this is probably one of the larger objects you're gonna see on the road. It's designed to be conspicuous. It's designed to stick out. It has flashing lights and it's designed to protect the road workers in front of it. As we can see here in this crash, he's only responded to that at the absolute last moment and he's actually swerved and hit the left rear corner of the attenuator pad. There was alcohol involved in this crash. But what we can do around the perception response is, well, could he have avoided this crash? And when we look at this one, he had 800 to a kilometer of clear visibility on the night. 
He has a vehicle that is perceivable well beyond that because of its flashing lights. So we can start to see this perception response area where what's actually happening here? What is the problem? And we will use the term, and unfortunately, if you've ever spent any time in court, you hear the term getting used a lot, which is, well, they were there to be seen. In this occasion here, it is pretty clear that they were there to be seen. But in some other occasions, there's actually some areas involved in it. So let's, let's have a look at that and pull that sort of apart. So the biggest area we look at is visibility versus conspicuity. The hazard has to be easily identified. And so this is our recognition area and also our perception area. So there is a distinct difference between being visible and being conspicuous. And we'll go through a couple of examples there. So the first area of visibility, a little bit of a technical term, something is visible without the aid of an instrument or device. So our object, we'll say I attenuate a truck in the middle of the road there, there is nothing blocking it visually. There's no obstructions, there's no high fence, there are no other vehicles involved, there's not a hump in the road. That vehicle is there and they are visible. But just because it's visible, doesn't mean the human eye is gonna pick it up. And this is another part of our little bit of evolutionary process for our brains and our eyes. Humans, we're very good at looking at con or identifying contrast, moving objects and things that are sticking out and remarkable and different from the background. Because we can't concentrate on everything in front of us, we scan. And when we scan, our brain is gonna pick those things up. And that's where being conspicuous is just as important, if not more important. So when something is conspicuous, does it attract the person's attention? Is it unusual? Is it remarkable? And a, an easy answer for this one here, or an easy response for a lot of health and safety is high visibility vests. You'll note that they're orange or green or pink. Um, you can get blue ones as well sometimes now. What we're trying to do with that vest is you're trying to make that person stick out from the background. And there's a lot of visual noise especially when you're driving through a town, you've got a lot of movement on the side, a lot of shops, a lot of street signs and all those other factors that are trying to bring in a driver's attention. And we need to look at it. And in the traffic management area, which is where I'm working in as well, it comes to the point where we start to look at, well, is it conspicuous or not? And when we look at a temporary traffic management area, we have orange cones and we can have hundreds of orange cones in some of the larger roadwork areas that I'm sure you're aware of, especially through the desert road at the moment, there's quite a lot of stop go traffic through there. So all the cones are orange. That's great, they're conspicuous, they stick out from the difference, from the background, I should say. But our road workers are also on orange and have to be in orange high visibility vests. So our road workers are no longer conspicuous because they're blending into that background of all the road cones as well. So it's just something to be aware of. And when you're looking at, maybe looking at high visibility vests or the color of the vehicles that you use or different aspects is that, a vehicle can be visible, but we also need to make sure it's conspicuous. So the easiest way to do that is just show a little bit of a visual representation. So visibility versus conspicuity. Our little lizard here is yellow and black. He is visible, there is no obstructions, but on the background, he's also conspicuous. He has bright colors, he has a distinct pattern, and the line and distinction around him is quite distinct. So our human eye is naturally going to be drawn to that if we're walking along a road or gravel area, we're going to see that. Now this lizard does that intentionally because he wants to warn off predators. But it's the same systems and the same process we have behind us in identifying risk when we're driving down the road. It's actually identifying we want to, if we want something to be sticking out and conspicuous and obvious, we need to start looking at things like pattern and lighting. So to sort of demonstrate the difference between being visible and there to be seen as they will use, the term that's incorrectly used, and conspicuous, I'm gonna show you the next slide. I'm gonna put it up for about a second and a half, and then I'm gonna take it back again, and then I'm gonna ask you a question about it. And it's just to answer yourself and take an honest um, look at this image as well, just to show you the difference. So I'm gonna bring up the image now, and then I'm gonna take it away in about a second and a half, probably about the time of a normal perception response. So that image there is a mountainside in Afghanistan. And I've used that image. So just think to yourselves what you saw there. How many soldiers did you see in that image? And be honest. So most people will answer they saw one or two. But in fact, in that image, there are four soldiers that are visible. They are visible, but they are not conspicuous because they're wearing camouflage. And that's their intention. They're breaking up their pattern and they're merging in with the background. 
So as drivers down the road, this is a very important aspect that we need to think about. And especially if you're looking at something like school crossing, you'll have the two people on the crossing guards who will be in the, in the high visibility vests so they stick out so the driver can see them. But all the other children are gonna merge into the background. And when we start thinking about that process, the human brain is gonna concentrate on our two crossing guards and probably not take much attention to the traffic or to the, the pedestrians and the children around them. And we have another look at a, another example here, which is a nighttime example. At night, we're reliant, we lack a lot of information. We're reliant on our headlights and other things illuminating themselves so we know where we're going. And when we think about headlights on the vehicle only by law have to illuminate 50 meters in front of us, that doesn't actually give us a lot of time to perceive and respond to what's going on. So in this example here, we have three people clearly visible and contrasted by the riot police behind. This is just a riot photo that I found online. But well, we can see those three people are highlighted. Our human brain, our perception and our response, our hazard identification is going to identify those three people. What we don't see here is the fact there's actually a gentleman with a camera right next to this photographer. And we have another five riot policemen also involved in this incident. But we can start to see that everyone was visible, there to be seen, but they're not conspicuous. And this becomes very relevant in nighttime crashes. And I can tell you now from the research, that a pedestrian walking down a rural road at night will be perceived in about when they're about 26 metres away from a vehicle. And when we start looking at perception response time of a second and a half, most of the time, unfortunately, that pedestrian is going to be struck before the driver of the vehicle actually has any time to perceive and respond and attempt to swerve or brake. So another aspect, and this is around the perception and response time, is our fatigue area. And look, fatigue, I know um, everyone's probably had a little bit of fatigue, fatigue, a lot of information around it, but fatigue is a big factor around perception response times, and it's why it's crucial that it's managed. And not just for the commercial operators who are under quite a bit of legislation about brakes and how long you can drive for, but actually members of the public. And this is one of the biggest factors around our crashes, especially in holiday times, when people are going to a lot of places, long drives, having a good time at those places and actually suffering from fatigue. And that's actually delaying a lot of their risk identification and their braking and all those sorts of aspects. And fatigue, look, it's typically seen and people understand it as a sleep disturbance or short-term insomnia. But what we actually need to understand as well, and more commonly as coming into the driving arena, is it's also a consequence of physical labor or prolonged experience. And physical labor is a big one in New Zealand. Uh, we have our delivery drivers in and out of the trucks, loading things in and out of the trucks, and then driving an entire shift. But more importantly, and what was a big factor for quite a while, was farmers. They work an entire day on the farm. They might be baling hay in summer. They're exhausted from that day's work, probably a little bit dehydrated. They get in their vehicles, and they switch off, and they're driving home. And we had, for a while, uh, back in about 2015, quite a few farmer-related fatigue crashes from the fact that they'd actually been working all day. And that physical labour can also work out for the people that like to spend quite long nights having a few drinks and that as well, as that's a long area that they have to look at. And our prolonged experience is actually a big factor for us when driving a vehicle. Now in a factory, they might move their workers around so they don't end up getting into a routine and getting bored and getting a little bit laxalazical with what's going on. But when we're driving a vehicle, we need to understand that that is very much a routine, steer, brake, accelerate, steer, brake, accelerate. That's that constant process down the road. Make sure you can drive around the corner. So there's some steering input into it. So it becomes a prolonged experience. And this is what is seen for people that drive for a long time, um, truck drivers, but also ambulance, fire, and especially for police. who spend a lot of time in a vehicle driving all day. It becomes a routine. And that's where fatigue can start to set in. And when it does set in, we get those delays in recognition and perception response times. And that means the vehicle's traveling down the road a longer distance before the driver's able to perceive the incident in front of them and make a response and then take that response, which might be braking or accelerating. And you can see this in some of the footage you see on the internet where people simply don't react to something that's in front of them. And you might think, well, how's that possible? They're there, it was visible. Well, it might be that there's actually those factors in there, fatigue and distraction and some of those others. A couple of the big issues we have here, and one of the biggest ones for the drivers themselves, is it's very hard for those affected by fatigue to actually be aware of it. And the more fatigue they get, the worse that process gets. 
And I'm sure we've all been in those occasions where we can get fatigued by something and you're not actually aware of it. And for those that operate um, systems like the Seeing Eye Machines, which actually record the driver and measure and identify fatigue in the vehicle, how many times have you had those conversations with the truck driver? When you said, hey, look, you've got to pull over. Um, we think you're fatigued. Oh, no, I'm fine. I've just got in the vehicle. The person themselves might perceive that subjectively they're not affected by fatigue, but the machine, the camera is actually identifying it. And that also becomes a problem with us in crash, where fatigue is heavily underreported by police because simply it's not something that is measurable on the roadside. You don't have a breath test for fatigue, and it's very hard to identify the factors. Now, there's a lot of information around that, and we go into that in a crash investigation. And for those that are interested, I can certainly talk to you about some of the, the risk factors that can be identified, but also how to control and manage that fatigue side of it as well, just from the physical labor and the prolonged experience side of things. So as I said, how it affects perception response is a little bit harder for us. There's no hard and fast figures, but what's come back from decades of research, simulator work, and also what's called the SHARP experiment in America, where they literally placed cameras and accelerometers and data gatherers in three and a half thousand members of the public in America and said, hey, just go driving for a year and we're gonna download your car every two weeks. So that information there, that naturalistic studies has actually brought back a lot more information about how people responded to actual crashes. Because funnily enough, those people got in quite a few crashes in that time. So some easy numbers that come out there and some numbers that I'm happy to, to sort of use, 17 to 19 hours awake is equivalent to our blood alcohol concentration in New Zealand. We call it 50 but it's 0.05 and that will affect your reaction time. So being fatigued is same as being under the influence of alcohol for our legal limit. If you're awake for 24 hours, that's equivalent to 0.10. Now our old breath alcohol limit or the limit that you would be charged in court for now is 0.08 or 80. So you can start to see that fatigue acts a lot like alcohol and it's interrupting those processes in the brain and delaying what's happening there. We add fatigue and alcohol, which is also a very common factor, and that starts actually accumulating on top of itself. And that's when things get quite um, concerning, especially around fatigue, alcohol, and drugs like cannabis, which all lead to delaying that perception response. So instead of our driver reacting how we expect them to in one and a half seconds, they may simply not. So we've looked at the visibility side, conspicuity side, things like that and fatigue. The other big factor out there and how it affects our perception response is distraction. Now, this is actual crash I attended on the Auckland Harbour Bridge. Um, the young lady of that car was um, texting her friend to say that she was going to be late, which well, is definitely going to be late now. Um, fortunately, in this crash, her vehicle did its job and she didn't actually suffer any injuries. But you can understand how it could be a whole lot worse involved in that crash. And that was the distraction side of it. Now, mobile phones, we're quite, the, the research is there, the data is there, and it's actually creeping up in the number of crashes that we're starting to see in serious injury and fatalities as well. But some nice, easy, simple stats for this case is talking on a mobile phone increases your crash risk by 400%. Now that's come from quite a few studies and it's also come from crashes as well. So using your phone you're more, and talking on it, you're four times more likely to be involved in a crash. So it's, in, it's increasing the crash risk. And it's equivalent or worse to the blood alcohol of 0.08. Now those numbers seem quite similar and they are between distraction and fatigue because at least the influence and the amount of alcohol is quite easily tested. So people can be tested in their responses when they're fatigued or distracted against someone who can have a measurable amount of alcohol as well. And that's why those numbers are used because they're a measurable limit. Now, where this actually becomes a big factor, especially for those in the industry where they may have dispatch computers like in taxis or delivery vehicles, is that this, those machines that are helping efficiency are also now becoming a distraction the same as Apple CarPlay or Android CarPlay, if your vehicle's fortunate enough to have that system. The driver is taking their attention away from the driving, both visually, but also in a cognitive and a brain processing manner. But what might um, shock a few people is it is no better talking on hands-free than it is talking on holding the phone. The holding of the phone is not the issue, it's the processing power that is needed for your brain to have a conversation on the phone. And that's a big factor. There is no significant difference between those that crash using their phone and holding it and those that crash and uh, their perception and their response is delayed when they're on hands-free. And that's because that process of holding that conversation, 
listening to the person, thinking about the question they may ask you and then giving them a reply. And, and I think we can all honestly sit there and say that if you've spoken on hands-free and I'll, I'll put my hand up, you can have that conversation for five minutes and you can get to a location and you can actually sit there and go, how did I actually get here? What was that intersection like? Was it green? Was it red? Was it yellow? And that's because your brain is switching on to autopilot. So it can hold the conversation that is switching what it sees as a very routine act of driving to, yep, I can keep it in the lane and keep it to a reasonable speed. But as we know, and we've all seen on the roads, someone talking on their phone is quite erratic in their driving generally, and their speed is very up and down. And that's because the brain is just trying to operate on a very simplest manner. And the fact and the problem comes into it is when that hazard presents itself in front of you, the red light, the child running out from the side of the road, another vehicle failing to comply with the give way sign. All those factors is when it starts delaying it. So it's that cognitive load, that brain power is actually their biggest factor. Uh, to be honest, any talking on the phone is going to influence your perception response time. And as maybe fleet managers and other people in that area, we need to start encouraging the fact that when you're driving, you are driving. You can update the system. You can update your, um, your dispatch system when they get to the location, not when they're driving. So how's this actually come into play and why is it such a big factor? Well, if we have a look at the, the, the physics here and, and I'm going to talk about speed and how it is a factor and how it contributes. So if we look at this graph here, um, in the red is your perception response time. So I've used an average time, I've used 1.5 seconds because it's a fairly round number. But you can start to see at 50 kilometers an hour and that time it takes you to remember to recognize, perceive, process and make a decision. At 50 kilometers an hour, if it's someone running a red light in front of you, you're going to travel 21 meters before, or you're likely to, an average person is, before you start braking, which is the green. Now, what you can see, the difference between the green and the red is, the green, the faster you go, the distance is exponentially increasing. It's not a linear process. So, and that comes down to a little bit of simple physics. And these numbers and distances here are what would be an average truck stopping. So an average truck driver, perceiving an incident and then applying their brakes and emergency stopping. So we can start to see that at 50 kilometers now, that's 35 meters, and at 100, it's 98 meters. So a little bit of difference in speed starts actually influencing how long it's going to take us to perceive and then respond to the crash. And that's a big factor for us to actually think about, especially as drivers ourselves, but also maybe training and looking after our fleet drivers is that actually the distance it takes to stop is actually influenced by the speed. And it is a big factor in your stopping distances. Um, it's a very simple formula. We use this information in the crash analyst to be able to give you some speeds that the vehicle is traveling at possibly prior to impact. So let's add in something that's quite measurable. And mobile phone distraction on average adds about 0.6 of a, of a second to your perception response time. So when we can start to look at it here and the mobile is in the, the middle area, we can start to see that our distances are now suddenly increased. At 50 kilometers an hour, it's an extra eight meters that vehicle is gonna travel before they start to break. And if we think about this uh, as a pedestrian, eight meters is a big distance if something is coming down the road and you've stepped out in front of them or the person maybe hasn't perceived you. We've got that extra distance. Now, if we start looking in the 90 and 100 kilometer area, we're now starting to look at by the time someone perceives something to happen, they're a little bit delayed because of the mobile phone, they're taking about a rugby field to stop their vehicle. And look, these numbers don't change much depending on how flash your truck is or how flash your car is. It all comes down to the physics of the tire and the road surface. And those numbers, as you can see there, get quite frighteningly larger the faster you go. Hence why 30 kilometers an hour and 50 kilometers an hour are quite commonly used and spoken about for safety with pedestrians. Now, it's not taking that away from the fact that pedestrian may have stepped out in front of you, but it can give some of your drivers and yourself a little bit of an understanding of why. And that's the important aspect around crash and prevention is why is it such a factor? Why do I need to worry about mobile phone usage? Why do I need to worry about the fact of how long it's going to take to perceive or respond to something? You can see there at 50 k's, if that was an intersection and someone was blowing a red light in front of you, so not your fault in the case, it could take you upwards of 43 metres by the time you've stopped. Now, most intersections are only 20 metres across. Hence why you need, and you're taught in advanced driver training, to be reading ahead. 
So the last one we're going to go through is what happens when it all goes wrong. So this is an actual case I investigated in Auckland. So for the Aucklanders, you'll understand where this is. Um, it's the Wellington Street Overbridge. This is northbound piece of motorway. And this incident happened just after the Victoria Tunnel was opened up, which everyone in Auckland were all excited about. It was a trench with a roof put on top, but it's a tunnel. It was exciting. This area of, of the motorway, just to give some context for the people outside of Auckland, 250,000 vehicles per day were driving under the overbridge at Mountain Road when this crash occurred, which is about 2012. 157,000 vehicles were covering Auckland Harbour Bridge every day. And in the busy times, we were looking at about 2,200 vehicles per lane per hour on the motorway in that section. So we have some very large traffic volumes that have occurred. And we're going to have a look at a crash between a car and a truck. And what I want you to have a look at here is we have a video. So I'm going to play the video. I want you to just have a look at it and think of it from the point of view of your driving the truck but also have a look at it objectively of what's actually going on, having a look at the information that's provided. So I'll play the video a couple of times for you just so we can go through it. And then I'll start discussing how I looked at this as an investigator and how I actually came to the proper or the appropriate outcome to this crash. So I'll just play the video. So I'll just play that again for everyone. And just once you've now had one look, but well, you can start to imagine perception response here. That entire piece of video from when you started seeing the cars coming through to the crash was about 15 seconds. So for our driver, he's got a lot less time to actually perceive and respond to what's happening in front of him. So let's just play that again for you. And all this information will become quite relevant when I quickly talk about this case. For those in the trucking industry, just of interest, a little bit of fun. The big cloud to the left-hand side of the truck as it slides down the motorway was the driver's logbook that came out. Um, it disintegrated, but don't worry, CVST put the entire thing back to sell it with sellotape. It took them about three days to go through his logbook. But we can start to see that this is quite a high impact crash. Now, just to let you know, uh, the driver of the car survived this. He was very seriously injured. And our truck driver, because he had a seatbelt on, basically got away with a Band-Aid for a cut on his forehead. So whilst it's quite a violent crash, vehicle systems, and actions of the drivers actually resulted in this crash being what was likely to be a fatal actually ended up in, in a serious result. And our 86 year old driver did respond. But if we start to look at this crash, when I turned up at the scene, I didn't have the video footage. I had my 28 ton truck lying across the road. I had a whole lot of scene evidence and I had what was left of the Toyota Camry after the, uh, the fire service who we affectionately um, call the evidence eradication team, cut the vehicle to get our driver out. He was walked out of the vehicle by the ambulance service, believe it or not. But we start to see some of the evidence that's involved here as well. So that's the container imprint in the road. And if you drove through that section of road, it sat there for about three years. And there's quite a bit of evidence there that's possible for me to start putting that vehicle back and how it actually occurred and the rollover and the sliding before we talked to it. And this was some of the recovery vehicles that we actually needed and was involved. We actually shut down the motorway for two and a half hours because all our recovery vehicles were stuck in Green Lane trying to come through, which included our cranes and everything else. So when we looked at this crash, I had a lot of pressure on me by my bosses to charge the truck driver. And most people would sit there and go, car's been rear-ended by a truck, it's the truck driver's fault. But for those that have looked at the video and what was kind of highlighted was, what was our truck driver's following distance like? I can tell you from the video analysis that he was about four seconds behind the the car that he unfortunately had a collision with. Now, for any of you that drive trucks or operate trucks in Auckland, you'll know that any following distance and maintaining that on the Auckland motorway for a truck driver is very hard to do because every car driver wants to jump in front of you. 
And that's something I saw in my, my eight years on the motorway patrolling it. So that truck driver was actually with his four seconds following distance, but he was still unfortunately struck the vehicle in front. And when we look at this, that car came from 80 kilometers an hour to a complete stop in three seconds. It's just not something the truck driver was expecting and it delayed his perception response. But he still actually behaved and responded in a pretty quick manner. And because when I interviewed him and went through some of the processes, he knew that the lane beside him was free, hence why he swerved at the last moment because he knew he couldn't brake and that's hence why the truck rolled. If he hadn't have done that, then the driver of that vehicle will most likely lost their life. The truck would have stayed upright, but because of his actions and him knowing his surroundings and his truck, he was able to swerve and reduce the severity of the crash. So we now might be saying, and some of the Aucklanders you'll understand maybe why this crash happened is, why did the crash happen? Are we just gonna charge our truck driver with careless driving causing injury and leave it at that? Or are we actually gonna investigate it? So for me as a crash analyst, I actually pulled this crash apart and got all the information. I was able to download the truck because it had a Navman Teletrack system in it and we would be able to be provided with that information. Now that did put our truck driver at 95 kilometers an hour just before that video started. It's an 80K limit. And whilst it's not a defense, if you notice the video, everyone was traveling at about that speed and that unfortunately is common in that area of that piece of road. Whilst it's an 80K limit, the majority of people travel through there at 95 to 100 kilometers an hour. But that's a little bit of information we're able to see. But from that Teletrack data, we could also see that he had regular brakes and the fact that he was driving between the port and the North Shore. So he was doing short trips with quite a bit of a break in between them, transporting a, a liquid plastic, a semi-liquid plastic for manufacturing in the container. So then we look at the other aspect. Well, why did our driver suddenly make a stop? And we'll talk about that next. But part of it is talking about, well, interviewing the driver. Now, he had no recollection of the crash, but some of the questions that I asked him were, are you familiar with a section of road? Do you drive often? And through that interview, I was able to perceive that he'd lived in Auckland all his life. He'd driven the motorways all his life. However, he was not a regular driver on the Auckland motorways for about three years before this crash because he'd made his own decision that he wasn't up to the fact of driving. So he'd never driven the section of motorway before. We also worked out that he'd been playing golf all that morning. This was in December. We were talking about 28, 29 degree days. He'd been playing golf from eight o'clock in the morning to 12.30 when this crash occurred. So physical labor, I know it's a game of golf, but he's an 86 year old gentleman. He'd had one cup of tea and a biscuit that entire morning. So he was highly likely to be suffering from fatigue. He was driving on an unfamiliar road. And the reason that he actually braked, what we worked out were these little fellas here. And these are ramped metering lights. Now they're on all the on-ramps on the Auckland motorway. And if you don't drive in Auckland, you probably don't understand them. But because no one in Auckland, or no New Zealander could learn how to merge properly, uh, the engineering response to that and the systems approach response was let's put ramp metering lights. So that controls and it puts through a vehicle every couple of seconds. So it controls the traffic on there. When you look at the video, he's emergency braked right when one of those lights, those that light cluster changes to red. So in this case, we've actually got a combination on the, of fatigue, driver uh, unfamiliarity with the area, but we've also in this case got an environmental issue. We have a light set of lights here. Now, why the numbers are there is this has never occurred before and in my knowledge never occurred again on the Auckland motorway network. But however, we've identified that factor. And at, I think it was around $150,000, um, Auckland Motorways and Alliance rotated all the traffic lights, all the con control lights anyway, and put shields on them for the entire motorway network. And that was to try and mitigate the factor or that risk of that light being misinterpreted by a driver again. So by looking at the information, the facts there, I was also able to work out that the truck couldn't have stopped even if he was traveling at 80. And in fact, if he was in a car, he still would have collided with the gentleman in the Toyota. However, obviously there's different forces involved and we have a truck which weighs a whole lot more. So we've got a lot of other information there. But in this case, I was able to put the information forward and that's my job. It's not to make a decision, but bring the facts forward. And the resultant outcome from this case was the 86 year old gentleman was warned for careless driving for his part in contributing, which was emergency braking when he didn't have to. And our truck driver was also warned for careless in the part that whilst there are a number of mitigating factors, he still was careless in the fact he was traveling faster than the posted speed limit at the time. And that's an appropriate outcome. If he'd been charged with careless driving causing injury because it wasn't investigated, he'd be looking at a 
disqualification of his license, which for him being an owner operator is the end of his income. He'd have to hire another driver. He's also got the fines and other factors that are involved, including the insurance payout from his insurance and what's happened. So a little bit of information there, looking at the perception response, I was able to put the figures forward to say that truck driver was doing the best he could in that situation, apart from our speed issue and over this post speed limit. And the fact there was some other information involved. And this is just a little funny meme that came up. Um, literally within 10 minutes of this crash happening, some of the office workers already got into the Transformers thing, but it's kind of a good illustration of seeing what happened in this case. And the container came off. Now, again, that was looked at, but the container's not designed to um, hold on the truck in an impact like this as well. But that was another aspect we looked at in the whole case. It's looking at that user, the vehicle, and the environment. So quickly, um, so I know you might have some questions in there. What can you guys do um, as managers or in the road safety area? Look, the most important aspect around a crash investigation is the collecting and recording of evidence. If you can do that, then someone such as myself as an analyst can actually look at that information. So have a plan. Talk to someone like myself, have a plan on how your organization is going to deal with a crash, whether it be a minor fender bender or a serious crash, we can always learn lessons from them. We can always put in processes or we can simply say that your truck driver did the best they could in the situation and the crash occurred through a number of other factors. So at a scene, photos, photos, photos. You don't have to be a photographer. Your iPhone or your Android phone will get those photos in there. As you can see in this image, there's a whole little road cones on the road. That was the vehicle swerving out of control. From that, I was able to calculate a speed for that vehicle that was 105 kilometers an hour. So he's on the wrong side of the road, he's swerved, and he's traveling at around 105 kilometers an hour in an 80K zone when he lost control of his vehicle. So that's very important information because it might be your trucking company that unfortunately that guy's collided with. And also look at things like securing your dash cam or even having a dash cam in your vehicle. That information is crucial to um, look after your driver, but also it gives a record of the crash. So you can imagine from that motorways crash, having that dash cam footage would have had the driver's audio reception. So what he was talking about, which would have had to be bleeped out um, if you listen to a statement, but also it gives us a little bit of an understanding of what their view was at the time and their perception and their subjective part. So I can give an objective response. And look, look at securing your other things, e-road, tele-track, a number of those data analysis systems, whilst you have them for tracking where your vehicle is, they actually record a whole lot more information than you're aware of. So talk to those providers, secure that piece of information. They normally secure a lot more information in a short term. So it's better to get that secured, which may be the speed and the deceleration or acceleration of your vehicle every second leading up to the crash. We've also got another wealth of data, some gear I have to download, other vehicles involved, those cars and the airbag systems. So on that Toyota Camry, if it was a late enough model, I would have actually been able to work out impact speeds, speed of the vehicle beforehand, where they're braking, where they're steering, and little half second segments. So it allows us to bring back and bring all that information together. But in the end, my job is to bring the facts to the table and bring an objective look. And sometimes when you're in a company or organization, ensuring your objective is actually a lot harder than it actually would is. So being able to get someone to come in there and be objective. And we all know trial by media. Isn't it better that you can get some information and some facts around that and provide and support your driver? Make sure that their account is correct. Or if it isn't correct, what can you do? Is there some driver training response or some other stuff that you can look at the crash? So look, thank you for that quick um, sort of run through this process. It is a massive subject. I've tried to sort of cover as much as I could. Um, in the area, but there's a lot more that can be covered and a lot of things with training. So what I'll do is I'll stop sharing my screen. And then um, if there's any questions or anything else that people would like to, um, to ask, or if there's questions there, Catherine, then fire them through. Yeah, there is. Thanks very much for that, Bruce. That was fascinating stuff. Um, I think given the time, we'll, we'll go right into the yeah, questions. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you can see them, but I'll just uh, read them out anyway. So we've got a couple of questions and some uh, comments as well. So the first one uh, from Christian is, if orange is a colour that blends into other colours on a work site, what is a good alternative for high vis? I guess, uh, and it's a very interesting one, and that one around traffic management is interesting because when I brought that up in a conference, they actually intentionally do that. Well, that's their system approach at the moment. For me, it's, it's a contrasting colour. So hence why fluorescent green is also a common one. Um, and you'll see that most emergency services use fluorescent green. 
But the other thing to think of, especially around work sites, is retro reflective panels. So not just having reflective material on it, if you are out there looking at high-vis vests and clothing, is retro reflective panels produce a whole lot more light from headlights than other panels. Um, and you can see that in roadwork sites. So it's those colors and the contrast, and it's the ability to, to step back, if you have a work site, of actually stepping back, taking a photo, positioning some people in there. It's nothing better than putting it together practically to see if fluorescent yellow is going to work for you or, or another color. Obviously, pink's good, but probably not a lot of people want to wear pink. Yeah. I think it's just a, the volume sometimes is, uh, it's like the same as signage, isn't it? Yeah. You see too many things at once, it's too much for your, your eyes to actually. Too much information is just yeah. as a problem as not enough. Hence why you try not to have a whole lot of road signs. But we can all see that when we go into a big roadworks area, you can sometimes get overloaded and be wondering where you are when you're in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah, and the next uh, one is not really a question as such, it's uh, quite a lengthy um, uh, piece from Hamish around fatigue. So I might just come back to that one, I suppose it's not really a question. Um, the other questions we have here are, Jerry, if you had the money, sorry, if you had the government purse and 100 mil to spend, where would you spend the money? Where would you spend the money? Um, interesting, Jay. <laughs> it's a very interesting question. For me, I'm a big advocate of driver training. We, we need to, whilst we have a systems approach and there is engineering responses and engineering on roads, you know, when we come back to that human factors and it's 85% of the time, let's actually look at trying to change the mindset of our drivers. We, ego, is, ego is always a big issue with drivers in New Zealand. Let's look at some of that training. And we're talking advanced driver training. I'm a big supporter of people like Greg Murphy's driver training program. And there's a number in the South Island. That advanced program, you know, put people in those emergency situations. And I guess a little test for a lot of the people that are here, and I did this with my wife, is have you actually ever had the ABS go, the anti-lock braking go off on your vehicle? It's actually in resulted in a lot of people crashing because they weren't used to what happened. So don't go and do it on the road, but find a big grass area and actually activate the ABS and see how your car feels. Because your initial response to that is going to be quite shocking and you're not going to expect it. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Uh, one from Tony here. Uh, how effective is the use of telematics to prevent accidents? So I presume you mean crashes there, Tony. Yeah, yeah, Chris. Uh, <laughs> no, look, it, I think it's very important. There's a wealth of data and a lot of companies just don't have the time to process it. But I think if it's used properly and you start looking at a company and maybe you've got a series of crashes that have occurred, actually looking at that data and someone like myself analysing it, because we can actually break apart and see exactly what the driver did, you know, when they braked, when they steered, was that perception response within the normal zone? And from that information, then you can learn and give you the, the evidence-based or the fact-based information to make those decisions. There's nothing worse than an e-jerk reaction. And I'm sure we've all seen them from within companies and also agencies and everything else. You get those facts together and I think there's time, that's when you can actually start working on it. Hmm. Thanks, Chris. Uh, one from Armin here. Uh, great presentation. Do you have data on the impact of ADAS systems? Uh, what can they make to avoid or minimize crashes, especially with regards to driver response times? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. For those that aren't aware of ADAS, it's the automated protection systems on vehicles. And they're coming into the trucking industry a lot, especially in the European vehicles. They are the systems that will break um, when they see a hazard in front of them regardless of what the driver does. But more importantly, the biggest thing with ADAS is what they found in testing was people weren't braking as hard as their vehicle could actually do. So they weren't stopping in time, even though their vehicle was capable. So those systems are very good at observing, seeing what the driver does with the pedal and then braking to the full extent. And you can see that in some of the Volvos and the Scania's, they can bring a vehicle, a truck to stop just about as fast as a car. So. Um, there is data out there, certainly get hold of me with, with that sort of thing. They are very good. And, and that's where some part of it, we're trying to um, sort of take a bit out of it, of the fatigue and the distraction, those other factors, letting the car try and assist the driver. But they are, as the name says, assistance. When we rely on them too much, which us good old New Zealanders do, we then can fall into the trap of it's not a perfect system either. They can only see about 50 metres in front of them or 100 at best. So sometimes you just can't stop in time anyway. 
um, just come to the time here. So we've got to try and get through a couple of other questions. And then if we have any more, what we will do is uh, pass them on to Bruce and we'll add them on to our website along with the presentation for today. But if you still have some time, Bruce, are you going okay for time? Yep. Yeah, no, I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. If you're still on the call and you're happy to um, hold on, we'll just pass these ones to Bruce. Otherwise, we'll pop them up on our website. Um, so um, one from Eric. In the collision investigation, you identify the signal issue. Do you know if a civil case was pursued against the roads authority as the signal head position was considered to be a contributory factor? Um, not in this case. Um, and that is something that's very hard to do in New Zealand. So I'm unsure if that person's from overseas. So in this case here, um, yeah, that wasn't pursued and it's not often pursued in New Zealand. So there is a criminal side to it um, and that's the police side. Uh, there may be, if it was a coronal hearing and there was a loss of life, there may be some other action, but generally the only other action is insurance companies. And I do a bit of work for some insurance companies looking at that side as well. That more comes back to which insurance company pays what. But it is, look, it's a factor that needs to be looked at. And if that crash hadn't been, I didn't spend the time to look through it, that could have been missed. And then we would have left that issue or hazard sitting there for later. So, and that was work between me and the engineers um, on the Auckland Motorway Alliance to actually start trying to work out what may have been a factor in that case. Hmm. Thanks, Chris. Uh, another one here from Tony. Should police get tougher on mobile use while driving like Australia and other countries? Uh, yes, 100%. <laughs> Look, I'm ex-police and I was a big enforcer, as my brothers will tell you. Um, but look, there is a place for enforcement. There's also a place for education and there's also a place for engineering. But I really think, you know, good education. And for me, an ad on TV is not education. That's just an ad that someone's going to watch or not. It's actually educating and giving the people the why. But I certainly do. Look, there's been a drop in enforcement and that's also resulted in an increase in crashes. And that fact is pretty black and white. And that's probably our main difference between us and Australia. Australia is very heavy on enforcement, but enforcement, you can't enforce you out of the problem either. There's still that education and that engineering response as well. Okay, and uh, one more here from Petra. My impression is the, is the results of those investigations are not shared with the public in New Zealand. Um, how shall the drivers learn of those events? Is there an accident or crash database accessible by the public? Um, there is the NZTA's crash analysis system. So that's their massive database. Getting data out of it is a little bit funny because it's a little bit old system, but it stores a lot of information. Um, but I look, I totally agree with you, Petra. There is a lack of passing this information on to people. And for me, I'd rather educate someone so they make the decision not to overtake on that blind corner for the right reasons, not worried about being enforced, you know, having police in that there as well. We need to pass that on. So most people, when they actually understand some of those facts, it will change their behavior. And for me, if I can change one person's behaviour in a presentation, then I'm actually doing my part. And I'm doing some driver education, hopefully, with young people in Christchurch in April. And we're going to start talking about this because that's an area where we can affect those changes. And yeah, if, when you know better, you do better. So if you don't know about these problems, you're not going to see the problem. And you can talk on your mobile phone for a year and never have a problem. But when that hazard does present itself, then you have that problem coming up. And now one final uh, question just from Kristen. Uh, I think I can answer this one anyway. Uh, you referred to some statistics in the Prezo. Are you able to reference where these came from on the website, please? And yes, we'll, we'll yes. Um, connect with Bruce after this and we'll get all that onto the website for you. Um, there are some other comments from Brian and from uh, Hamish. Um, not questions as such, but more um, as advice and guidance that we can add on to the questions mm -hmm. as well. Um, is there, finally, is there any other questions there from anybody else before we call, a, call the end of the presentation just now? Doesn't seem to be um, the case. So thanks again. And um, we will get all those, the commentary as well added onto the website after this. Just a huge thank you from me, Bruce. It was really um, eye-opening and lots that you think you know a lot and then you just realize, yeah, there's so much more to learn. If, if there's anything out there, it's that learning is something that people mm. do all of the time. You can never stop learning. And there's always a different perspective, a different outlook, different evidence and data that you can glean to help your understanding. And for me, the 15%, the, 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 the roads of 10 and the vehicle and 5%, five, 5%, I think it was, is mm. such an interesting 
um, number and percentage and what we can do as human beings, whether that be with your, your uh, as an employer or as an individual, there's so much more that you can do. So a huge thank you from me and thank you to everyone who joined us on the call this morning. Um, there will be a short survey at the end of this. So if you do have five minutes, we'd really appreciate it if you could stay on uh, and complete the survey, um, that'd be great. Thank you so much and uh, have a great day to everyone. Sure. Thanks all, bye-bye.